Hey, brother. I did that the last time I was on this channel. Now I feel like I have to do it every time. Scott here from the channel NerdSync. You may have seen me before on this channel theorizing about J. Jonah Jameson and his son, you know, the astronaut. I have a confession to make. Do you remember the first Toy Story movie when Woody and Buzz are taken to Sid's house with the creepy toys that are all cobbled together into nightmare fuel that all eventually surround Sid and spring to life in front of him, no doubt scarring the kid for life? Yeah! That terrified me. I don't know if I'm alone in that, but the sequences at Sid's house play into a ton of horror tropes and even make references to iconic scary movies, so even if you weren't scared, you should be. Like me. And here's why. Now, it's no secret that Toy Story has plenty of references to horror movies. As the toys spring to life to terrorize Sid, they stagger towards him like zombies rising from their grave. Woody's famous line, we see everything, looks suspiciously like the creepy slow 360 degree head spin from The Exorcist. There's a quick reference to alien chest bursters at Pizza Planet, and probably most notably, the carpet in Sid's house is eerily reminiscent of the carpet in the Overlook Hotel from The Shining, a horror movie so famous it's furniture has become iconic. That's just one of the countless references to The Shining throughout the whole Toy Story franchise, and even Pixar in general. Then there's Sid himself, a child Dr. Frankenstein, cobbling together his own monsters by fusing mismatched toy parts into mutant playthings. When Woody and Buzz first encounter Sid's creations, Woody freaks out at the sheer sight of them. It's not that they're strangers and he's scared of toys he doesn't know. He initially tries to befriend them. It's only after Woody sees their full forms that he becomes terrified. Rightfully so, if you ask me. There's that baby face spider robot thing, the fishing rod with legs, and whatever the heck this guy is. I'm not okay with it. The point is, these mutant toys are scary. But why? In his book, The Philosophy of Horror, author Noel Carroll attempted to break down precisely what it is that makes something horrific. Why do we find certain things scary? The answer is a little bit more complex than you might think at first, but to put it simply, Carroll gives two definitive traits that describe what he calls art horror, to differentiate it from real life horror, I suppose. Quote, the objects of art horror are essentially threatening and impure. End quote. Now, the first part is pretty obvious, right? For something to be scary, it has to be threatening, or at the very least, appear threatening. Even though the mutant toys were actually gentle and helping, Woody and Buzz mistake them for cannibals when they first meet. They're cannibals. <laughs> they were scared for their lives. Same goes for any other horror monster, from slasher flicks to paranormal terrors. There's always some element of life-threatening danger. But that's only one part of the equation, right? Almost every movie has some kind of threat. You wouldn't say that Spider-Man Homecoming is a horror movie. Unless you really hate spiders. They're men. So that is where the second part of Carol's theory of art horror comes in. Art horror. You gotta say it like that. You gotta say art horror. Art horror. You don't have to say it like that. That threat must also be impure. And while that can mean things like dirty or slimy, what impure really means in this context is more about our inability to recognize and categorize what it is that we're looking at. So for example, Woody is a cowboy. Buzz is a spaceman. Rex is a... You get it. Were you scared? Tell me honestly. But with Sid's fusion toys, I don't, what am, what am I looking at? These toys don't fit neatly into a preconceived idea box that the rest of us have. They're uncategorical. But you know, humans being humans meant that it was only a matter of time before someone came along to make sense of the senseless, to comprehend the incomprehensible, and to finally categorize the uncategorical. And we have Noel Carroll to thank for this again, for sorting impure horror monsters into four occasionally overlapping groups. First, the contradictory, something that defies its own logic, like a ghost being both dead and yet somehow alive. Another example would be like a haunted house being both inanimate and yet somehow has some spark of life in it. Next up is the incomplete. This usually refers to characters that are missing some crucial part of their physical embodiment, like the Headless Horseman, for example, or probably more famously, Zombies are always rotten away, missing limbs and whatnot. The third category is the formless. And as you would expect, this describes an entity that doesn't take a solid singular physical manifestation. Shaped shifters like Pennywise from It or even Boggarts from Harry Potter are really good examples of this. This archetype can also refer to something that's not entirely seen, like monsters that cling to the shadows and are never fully revealed, or, you know, the shark from Jaws. Sure, it's not technically formless, it has a shark body, but it may as well be for how little we see of it throughout the film, both the characters in the story and 
and we as an audience get spooked precisely because it stays hidden. The final group is the interstitial. It's the mixing of what would normally be distinct and separate sources to form one single identity. Like a werewolf being both man and wolf, or more famously, Frankenstein's monster constructed from different parts of humans and animals to create one iconic beast. And remember, Sid in Toy Story is standing in as a Dr. Frankenstein-esque character. This provides us with the answer to why the mutant toys are scary. Each one of them is an interstitial creation. A fishing rod with legs? A car with arms? Or a baby head with mechanical spider legs? Bonus points to Babyface on that last one for also fitting into the incomplete category with that missing eye. And that actually brings up a pretty good point. These categories aren't definitive, nor are they mutually exclusive. But what's important is that they all derive from a similar point of view. Things that we deem unnatural are unnerving. They threaten common knowledge and expose holes in our understanding of the world. They reveal how we thought the world works is not actually how the world is, and that is terrifying. Like, follow me on this one. Uh, imagine you're a young kid, growing up, playing with your toys, not a, not a care in the world. Then you discover that toys are alive and can watch you from anywhere. And that is what traumatizes Sid at the end. Unlike me, and definitely others, not just me, Sid is not scared by the interstitial nature of the toys. He's the one who made them. He likes them that way. Instead, what frightens him is the first category that we talked about, the contradictory nature of the toys, inanimate objects suddenly springing to life and coming straight for him. No thank you. I've seen Child's Play. I know how this ends. Sid's fusion toys are both impure and perceived as threatening on more than one occasion. They tick both of Noel Carroll's boxes for identifying horror monsters. And it's all augmented by context and character response. The spookiness of Sid's room provides an uneasy atmosphere, and Woody's fearful response informs us as the audience to be afraid along with him. That's the unique thing about horror. As Carroll points out, our responses are meant ideally to parallel those of the characters in the story, which is not always the case with other genres. I mean, think about it, right? When Woody is being knocked around in the back of the Pizza Planet truck, it's played for laughs. I mean, he certainly doesn't find it funny, but we're not meant to feel bad for him. I mean, this is Pixar we're talking about. If they wanted us to feel sad, they could do that. They could do that. But as Carol concludes, with horror, the situation is different. For in horror, the emotions of the characters and those of the audience are synchronized in certain pertinent respects. So the next time you watch Toy Story and get slightly unnerved by Sid's creepy toys, now you know why. Even though that's, it's probably not much consolation. But what do you think about Toy Story's fascinating connections to the horror genre? Did you ever find the sequences at Sid's house to be as scary as I did and still do? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And hey, if you want to hear more of my over-analytical thoughts about nerdy things, I have a channel called NerdSync, where we make educational videos about comic books and superheroes every single week to varying degrees of success. You should go subscribe, if you dare! That was weird for no reason. Thanks again for having me. This was super fun. My name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics. Or, in this case, Toy Story. See ya.